Welcome to Putting Together, the podcast that goes through the entire body of work of Stephen Sondheim, show by show and song by song. My name is Kyle Marshall, your self-described Sondheim expert. Now, that is true that normally we go through the entire body of work of Stephen Sondheim, but because of the great support that we have over on our Patreon page, once a month we do what is called a Sondheim adjacent episode, so somewhat tangentially related to Stephen Sondheim. And this month I decided that we should maybe look at Bernadette Peters playing the witch originally in Into the Woods. And maybe see her foray into film. And this month I've chosen to discuss Pennies from Heaven. Every time it rains, it rains. Pennies from heaven. Once upon a time, America was singing the blues. Pennies from heaven. Now from the music of the past comes the musical of the future. Pennies from Heaven. Starring Steve Martin in a dazzlingly different role as Arthur Parker, the music salesman who believes in a world where the songs come true. No more money in the bank. No cute baby we can spank. So what's to do about it? Let's put what are you doing, Arthur? I was pretending. Bernadette Peters is the school teacher. Quiet. Who gives up everything to follow Arthur and his dream. And as a great longtime guest of the show, I have ensorcelled William White to come here and join me once again. Will, thank you for coming back. Good morning, Kyle. Thanks so much for having me. So I don't know where to start necessarily, but I guess we'll start with uh, how familiar are you with this film? Uh, I had never heard of the film before you reached out to me about this podcast. Um, I had certainly never seen it. Uh, I watched the trailer after you mm -hmm. suggested it, and I was really excited about watching it because it has all of these great musical sequences and dance numbers mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So yeah, I mean, prior to this past week, not familiar at all. What about you? Uh, so because I have a problem, <laughs> one of my favorite pastimes is I get into these little rabbit holes of like, hmm, I wonder what this person's filmography is. And I'll just like go and just kind of take a look. And so I have done that for like Bernadette Peters, Steve Martin, and even the director of this, Herbert Ross, who actually keeps coming up in Sondheim adjacent episodes because he directed Last of Sheila uh, oh. and he directed The 7% Solution, which you were on that episode oh, for. Yeah, so right. like, he kind of keeps being tangentially related. And so I kind of heard it from doing that here in the last few years, because when this movie came out, it was a big old box office bomb. It made like no money <laughs> back in 1981. Do you know it all? Did you look at Wikipedia or any online sources as far as like the history of how this got made? I did read the Wikipedia article about this okay. movie. So I guess this, so I'm not talking all the time. Where does it start, this concept? Well, I don't remember. You have to tell. Oh, it's a BBC show, right? It's, it was, it, was, it was. it a miniseries or something? It was a BBC miniseries uh -huh. that starred Bob Hoskins and Cheryl Campbell were the two people over on the BBC who started in it. And it was very well acclaimed at the time for this BBC show. One of the people who happened to stumble upon it was Steve Martin. And he figured that this is like the best thing potentially that he'd ever seen in his entire life. Like he loved it that much. So I don't know if he specifically tries to secure the rights or, you know, talks to a producer to try and secure the rights. Regardless, they do. And one of those like Hollywood shenanigans of like they buy the rights from the BBC, prevent the BBC from even airing the miniseries for a decade. That was like in the contract. They weren't allowed to even show it. And then don't even ask the original actors to be a part of the production, which always kind of upset uh, the original cast. But regardless, this was seen as Steve Martin's first dramatic film to to star in he was wanting to flex his skills he even takes it was a few months i don't know he took da tap dancing lessons so that he could actually do some of the dancing sequences inside of this but the thing that we might be dancing around here a little bit if people have not seen this film is that while it is a musical people break out into song and they dance and there's like these huge lavish uh, scenes when this happens they are lip syncing not to their own vocals but to the original vocals of these 1930s tunes that are making up the soundtrack. 
Yeah, I mean that is. I, mean, that I don't is know if the, that works for you. Well, <laughs> Will it's, or it's not. definitely the distinctive feature of this movie is that yeah, there's no mm -hmm. actual singing. So I mean, I guess I would say that if you're a fan, as I am, of those 1930s songs in their old recordings, and you know the the big band arrangements and um, you know vocals by the likes of Fred Astaire or maybe um, I don't know. Uh, Gosh, I, I I don't know who the other crooners are on the on the soundtrack exactly, but you know pe people like Fred Astaire. Then you know that's it's uh, it's quite enjoyable. I would say that the fact that they weren't singing their own vocals that did not detract. Let let me just put it this way: that's not what estranged me uh, from this movie. Um, I have a feeling, yeah, it's going to be one of two parts. So there are these flights of fancy these musical sequences they're using the original 1930s tracks but the actual story i would posit is fairly grim <laughs> like it is, it's a very harsh change when they go from you know depression era guy wanting to cheat on his wife forces his girlfriend to go into prostitution storyline that is basically the crux of this story like and it doesn't shy away from those facts and then this complete 180 to go into we're now Busby Berkeley musical numbers like that is what this movie is. Yeah, this movie, it's like, I, I don't know, I would just say to your listeners if they haven't seen it, like if you like Follies, but you find that it wasn't um, either lavish or depressing enough for you, then this is your movie. I will say that you bring I was going to wait to the end, but uh, just because you brought it up. This does kind of kill me a little bit that Herbert Ross was not asked to do a Follies adaptation because I feel mm. the scene what he could do with some of these musical sequences. I think, oh, right. you, could, you could have done it. You could have made this work. And what you say about Busby Berkeley style, I mean, is spot on. And so, I mean, you know, even though the characters are, or the actors are not doing their own singing, they're definitely doing their own dancing. And the dancing in this movie is incredible. Yeah, I well, Christopher Walken makes a kind of a cameo appearance basically inside this film. And I know he's a trained dancer. I knew that from his biography. So I loved his sequence. <laughs> I yeah. just wanted more of that, in fact. Stole the show. Stole yeah. the show. Absolutely scene stealing performance. I will say, I'm not going to say he's amazing. I was a little bit impressed with some of what Steve Martin was able to do because he does a, Steve Martin a was front great. flip like at one point like oh I've never yes. seen Steve Martin do this before no he was in top form and and yeah. the dance sequences that he did were um really superb I mean the choreography is just amazing and the cast of like hundreds that they have in some of these scenes mm -hmm. uh, and uh, to, to me I mean you know I would say that my takeaway from this movie is that like I, I, I'm glad that you told me about it and that I watched it just out of a curiosity point of view. I don't think I would ever want to watch the whole movie again, but the dance sequences, I, I haven't looked on YouTube, but I mean, I'm sure there's got to be some of them on I'm YouTube. I'm sure they're there. Yeah. Um, but especially the kids in the school, uh, oh, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Was, that was incredible. Their These discs little... turned into mini pianos, which I thought was yeah. a fun little touch. Yeah. Yeah, so that was really good. But no, I loved all of the, I mean, the, um, you know, I guess the point that this movie is trying to make is that, you know, these 1930s musicals, especially the ho Hollywood kind of spectacle musicals where they present the whole world as, you know, this sort of glistening, sparkling magic place that, you know, that was like so contrary to the grim reality of the depression and all of these weird messed up people doing weird messed up things in the world i don't know i mean i guess that i would i would say i i don't find it hard to understand why this movie did not succeed at the box right. office because it's just like i think that if you are a person who uh, aesthetically is drawn towards that sort of 1930s you know musical fantasy land then you're drawn to it for that reason, that it's presenting a fantasy, whether you right. are a somebody living in the grim years of the Depression or later on. You know, we, I, I think that we like these sort of fairyland fairy stories that are told in these uh, movies and musicals. You know, we don't watch them for, for a grim, bitter reality of the world. Yeah, although I will say, while I think that there's a... A nugget of something that's interesting there about contrasting the reality versus the popular musical form of the time. I would say that there are some songs in that period that are mournful, sorrowful, that don't necessarily adhere to this idea that everything is is rosy and, and great type of thing. Like, um, yeah, I think that there are definitely songs, but I don't think that they really 
turn up in musicals so much. And even when they do, you know, I mean, the depression is represented in musical theater and in Hollywood. There, there's no question about it. But, you know, th there's always like a gloss put on top of it. Sure. You know, yeah, yeah. There, there's a there's a veneer and, and people are basically decent. And in, in this movie, um, I don't know. I mean, it's interesting in the fact that it sort of jostles our received moral codes about like characters and, and mm -hmm. their personalities. But, uh, you know, it's not in a way that's particularly comfortable. Maybe we should flesh out a little bit more of the plot and characters. Um, yeah, I think that that's a good idea. So as a quick little plot synopsis, we have Steve Martin plays this character by the name of Arthur Parker, who has a business that's failing, a, a wife that refuses him. Well, basically, she refuses money that she inherited I believe from her dad because he wants to start his own business. His big thing is that he loves this music of the time period. He thinks he can pick hit songs. And so like that's this business that he wants to start is to go and well, sell he, sheet music. He, sells, to he sells sheet music, but he, he's got a bad um, he's got a bad like region. You know, he's right. he's only selling in like, I don't know, Winnetka, Illinois. And he wants to he wants to uh, muscle in on the Indianapolis market. which I thought was really funny. Yeah, he right from basically the very beginning uh, lives out his um, i guess um inner world with the music of of the time so he on one of these business trips he meets eileen uh this is the role that's played by Bernadette peters and he's like instantly attracted falling in love sort of thing and they embark on this affair yeah, and she's a very innocent yes. uh very you know farm house uh you know pretty girl she's teaches in a schoolhouse um she's just got like the most kind of prim upstanding life that you can imagine and then uh their affair leads to her getting pregnant and because this is the 30s her being pregnant without being married is a big problem so she is fired from her job by john mcmartin i will by say john mcmartin this is a double sondheim <laughs> yeah uh, a double tangential sondheim thing i mean my gosh and you know talk about follies i mean come on oh and i guess the narrator for uh, the um into the woods for sure. uh, the 2002 version so yeah john mcmartin a good hand <laughs> to, to bring into this so she's fired then she you know gets drug into the life of prostitution this is where she meets the um christopher walken character to lure her into this lifestyle she starts calling herself lulu at this point arthur meets up with her again they revive this romance he basically leaves his wife at this point and then i think they come to this agreement that they are going to just run away together so he smashes up his business they take off into the night and then the gosh the the, the police basically catch up with him at well the there, end. there's there's sort of a side plot which is yeah. that early on in the movie um steve martin is driving through this town where he's going to meet bernadette peters or you right. know where, where he eventually uh, will see her and be sort of awestruck by her and uh he meets somebody who i uh, you know in the parlance of the times we would call a hobo i mean you know probably somebody right. who's riding the rails and sort of living on the street you know uh living rough and um this guy's a, a very peculiar character also the the actor who plays him uh, has an amazing name vernel bagneris wow um, and apparently he was like a um, like a sort of experimental historical cabaret artist, um, Whoa, okay. and, but has appeared in other stuff. Uh, anyway, he's he's a weird guy. Um, he 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 seems you know like a little off. His uh, while he's living on the street, the, the way that he makes money is he plays hymns on an accordion. Right. Um, and uh, and uh, Bernadette Peters gives him I think a, a nickel for doing this or something. And and so I don't know. Uh, I guess um, Steve Martin kind of you know gives him. A ride he's he's you know hitching and uh takes him to this town and buys him a meal you know and so we just yep. get the idea that he's you know steve martin's kind of a stand-up guy although there's a lot of cues that he's actually not so great anyway so this this weirdo is kind of out on the prowl and another person who steve martin meets a little bit later in the movie is this blind girl who's just like she lives in this town and she's she's walking down the street she is nervous all the time because, you know, she can't see and there's all these creeps <laughs> around. And one day she stumbles over the the Vernel Bagneris accordion man. And uh, we find out later that that uh, he rapes and kills her. And because Steve Martin, he, he left a cigarette pack, you know, near that uh, place. And, um, you know, people have seen him around. Uh, the cops basically finger him for the murder. 
and uh, he's he's arrested and, and hung at the end. So yeah. that's that's the the side plot. Although doesn't he come? Whose fantasy is it then when he comes back at the very end because they think that they should have a happy ending? Uh, I think that's the director's fantasy. I don't know. It's like it's just some yeah. I don't know. Anyways, as you can understand by this now <laughs> plot description, this is a pretty grim movie for yeah, for a lot I, of it. I, I don't even know if this communicates quite the grimness. I mean, there's there's yeah. all of these details about how like gritty these people are. I mean, like mm. you you could almost imagine a version of like for say, take something like Oklahoma, right? I mean, mm. uh, J- Jud Fry is uh, you know a character sort of like the accordion man here, sure, and yeah, yet. Yeah. You know, there is this gloss on Oklahoma, even though, you know, it has its dark moments. But in this, it's like Steve Martin, like, you know, his his wife is totally traumatized sexually. I mean, she can't even look him in the face and he wants her to like put lipstick on her nipples and he's like talking about it. He's like, and then, you know, he he really is sort of creepy around this blind girl. And um, there's just all of these details that are very... Uh, yeah, this is this is weird. the hard nut to crack because I watched this last night. I was really conflicted with what I felt about it. What you said at the beginning is true. Like, I don't know if I want to watch this ever again, but I almost feel like I need to, to like fully come up with what I feel about it <laughs> because I kept thinking like, would I prefer this as just a straight drama and only maybe a couple of sequences where they go into the flight of fancy instead of it being almost like a constant thing? throughout you can be very particular about when you do it it's like or is part of the issue that i'm having is that i have a very particular idea of what steve martin is in my head (laughs) and that's what's not gelling because he has played cads and kind of awful people throughout his career whether that's um dirty rotten scoundrels whether that's a little shop of horrors but still with that comedic bent to it i would say even his other dramatic film that i'm somewhat familiar with is uh, novocaine that came out in the early 2000s i don't know there's still something there that i can like approach the character with and this like from basically the first scene i'm like i don't like this person at all and i don't know if that's just like a modern viewing of it and it's messing with me too much where it's like nope uh but at the same time it's like i just really don't like spending time with this guy and maybe that's part of the point though yeah there's something very uncanny about it isn't there because Mm -hmm. i mean steve martin's winning personality comes through at every moment and you know i was reading that he said that like oh well people just couldn't accept me as a dramatic lead you know everybody was expecting this comedy but it's like steve buddy like every line that comes out of your mouth has this little comedic undertone behind it you know has yeah it's almost like he can't be entirely sincere yeah Yeah. he can't be sincere (laughs) exactly i don't know i mean uh, in a way would i have liked it with fewer of the musical numbers definitely not i I think that i would have liked it less (laughs) i mean the musical numbers which were so good really pulled me um, through yeah yeah were definitely what kept me engaged well the other thing here is that the the other thing that i think we might disagree on here is well again i love the, the musical sequences like i really love all of them i think what they kept coming and bouncing off of was i didn't need them to be lip syncing the words. I really feel like they should just mm. have been dance sequences with mm-hmm. the song playing, but I don't need them to be lip syncing the words at the same time. It was like, almost like a bridge too far for me. It's like, eh, I just don't need you to be doing that. Just do the dance sequence. I think it would have been stronger. I don't think I disagree with you there, but it didn't bother me. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I but I'm not like strongly partisan, like, oh no, they had to be lip syncing. How dare you? <laughs> um, and, and I would say too, like, uh, you know, they, so they 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 play the original tracks, mm-hmm. but they also pad them. Um, you know, they do. Uh, there there is like original kind of big bands arrangements. Oh, sure, yeah, that yeah. fill in. You know, that that extends the length of some of these songs so that they can have more extended dance sequences. There's no original singing, but there is some original arranged instrumental music. Do you know Marvin Hamlish is like credited at the beginning, but he didn't orchestrate, did he? No, I think that I think that the main part of the orchestration was this guy Billy May, right? Okay, um, who who was a big band, you know, trumpeter originally, and then became like a big Hollywood arranger orchestrator type guy. I, I think mm-hmm. that he did most of it. But I, I imagine Hamlish did, you know, a fair amount. Anyway, so the the music is really the selling point of this. I um we've 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 called out some of the musical sequences. The one that we haven't talked about yet that is probably vying for my top spot, but I don't know. Would definitely be in my top three. I loved when they go into the Fred Astaire movie. (laughs) So it goes black and white. 
essentially Steve Martin takes on the uh, Fred Astaire role, Bernadette Peters. It's not Ginger Rogers. I can't remember the actress who's in that movie that they go into. But anyway, oh, it's not Ginger then, Rogers. Oh, okay. I'm pretty sure it's not. I should maybe double check that, but I don't think it was. Regardless, I love that black and white sequence. I thought it was done so wonderfully to the time. It felt very like, yeah, this I could I could be swayed that this was a 1930s film that was restored. It was beautiful. I mean, you know, there's a few movies that I thought of while while watching this one. <laughs> In a way, you know, uh, interestingly enough, one movie that came to mind was actually Reds. That we watched. Oh, inter- oh yeah, right. <laughs> you know, just in terms of like the break, like like something, you know, the, the kind of documentary kind of realism and then breaking into the talking heads in Reds. It, mm-hmm. You know, breaking into the musical sequences was a little bit like that in this movie. And I don't know, just something, they, they were made right about the same time. Something about the film stock just sort of, you know, looks similar. Yeah, this, this is where I start to sound like so old, but I have such a love affair of the film stock from basically the late 70s to the mid 80s. Like, I just mm-hmm. love the look of it. Even like dumb, low rank comedies from that time period <laughs> just look great to me. Well, that's what we grew up with. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's uh, that's what it is. It's so totally men. rose-colored glasses, but I still love the look of it. By the way, I'm totally wrong. It is Ginger Rogers in that movie. It is Ginger Rogers. Okay, yeah. yeah. It's, no, it's I, and, follow the fleet is what the movie is that they're watching and then go inside of. And by the way, let me co-sign that um, your your opinion. I mean, that was an amazing sequence. Did you read what Fred Astaire yeah. said about this? He said, uh, I have never spent two more miserable hours in my life. Every scene was cheap and vulgar. They don't realize that the 30s were a very innocent age and that the film should have been set in the 80s. It was just froth. Makes you cry. It's so distasteful. Now, I agree with him that it is sort of distasteful. I mean, especially Mm -hmm. if that's your perspective. But, you know, I I think Fred Astaire is too much on the other side of, you know, I mean, here he was creating this total fantasy world about, you know, saying that the 30s were an innocent time. I mean... It was an instant age in 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 terms of the fact that that's what was being portrayed on the screens, and yeah. so I think that the the culture at large, the 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 mega culture, you wouldn't have heard dirty words or any reference to sex or um you know th- uh, uh, talk about an abortion. I mean you know Bernadette yeah, right, gets yeah. rid of the k- kid in this movie, or pros- you know you might have heard uh, that prostitution could have been an element, but not in the way that's portrayed in this not movie. The way it's so, portrayed. Yeah, th- this is totally one of those things because he made his living perpetuating the fantasy i this movie is essentially attacking uh, in a way the, those films although still technically being a love letter to to those songs so i could see him being miffed at that i don't really agree with him too much about the 30s being an innocent time again i think that is the movies sure if we're, we're going to make that argument but i i think that is again rose colored glasses a little bit where i might agree with them a little bit i mean it kind of ruins the plot a little bit i could see the it being set in the 1980s though to to really underscore like why would anyone think they could make a living out of you know selling this type of music it is such a bygone era at that time okay but and and this brings up actually a a bit of a plot hole or at least something i didn't understand why so so eventually he um runs away from his wife steve martin for you know at the beginning of the movie after she's um she won't give him either the money or the sex that he right. desires. And that's when he goes and meets up with Bernadette Peters and, um, you know, has this little affair, which probably lasts, I don't know, a couple of days, something like this. And so he comes back to his wife. And and because she's so grateful that he'd come back, she's now put the lipstick on her nipples like he's been asking for. Yeah, right, right. And she gives him the money. Not to, as he said at the beginning, to try to get like a better geographical region to uh, hawk his uh, sheet music, but to open a record store in Chicago. And it's 1934. I I was actually very confused. His, His record store flops. Like right. it doesn't, it doesn't do it. I was so confused. Like why, why doesn't, why don't people buy records at his record store? It seems like a perfectly good record store. It's got a nice, uh, you know, so store all based on and... location. Like he's just in the wrong location. I, don't I know. guess so. Yeah. I he was no sort idea. of right under an L. Um, but, yeah. uh, I, I don't know that, that, that needed a little bit of explanation to me. I mean, I guess, mm. I guess not every record shop is going to succeed, but it seems like that would be a pretty surefire business in 1934. Because this is a Sondheim adjacent episode specifically about Bernadette Peters, we might want to talk about her a little bit more. (laughs) Not to get too salacious with this, but if people don't know, her and Steve Martin were dating at the time. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah, I don't know if they meet on the jerk or just before. Anyways, they, you know, have a relationship. And only one year later, when the musical Annie comes out, Steve Martin was supposed to be in that movie too, but they had broken up by that time. And then Tim Curry took over 
the role. I don't want to say that that's the only reason she is cast in this movie, but it's probably a big reason why she is cast in this movie. But that being said, my biggest gripe is, again, going back to the uh, the uh, lip syncing, the lip syncing mm-hmm. thing <laughs> is that when you cast Bernadette Peters in a musical, I kind of want to hear Bernadette Peters sing. Yes, I, I, I would agree with that entirely. I thought that she was great in this movie. Yeah. Um, she really t- took the character on the arc. Like, you know, you could see how she, and boy, in that scene where she's, um, she, she goes into the bar with, uh, Christopher Walken for the first time. I mean, you really see her, yeah. um, you know, force herself to do something she doesn't want to. And then, you know, in the latter half of the movie where she's become a more experienced prostitute, you know, her, she has this kind of, she sees it as a bit of a liberation and, and she yeah. really makes you buy this, um, transformation from being a very prim school teacher at the opening to, to a, uh, a woman who's lived a bit. Bernadette Peters has had a wonderful Broadway career. She's done some guest spots on television. She's had these opportunities in film. I'm not, I'm sure she's very comfortable in, in her, in her life. At the same time, I do get a little disappointed because like this was obviously coming from the late 70s. She, she has um, a sitcom that's held by Norman Lear that lasts, I forget, one or two seasons and then is canceled. Then is in The Jerk, which does pretty good is in this movie that kind of bombs or that actually have outright bombs. I don't think it even makes half of what its budget was is in Annie the next year, which also underperforms. And then basically her movie career is done (laughs) at that point. And these performances I see her in are always good, strong, wonderful. Like there was what Bernadette Peters could do at the time, which is like a fluctuate between like, uh, light comedy, but also like tear your heart out at the same time. And I'm just somewhat disappointed to be like, oh, like she could have grown to be something bigger if these movies had actually been hits or even like modest successes so that she could continue being cast in, in different things. But that's an alternate history we don't Yeah, but in. then, I mean, if she, if she had become a big movie star, then she wouldn't have been, you know, she wouldn't in have into been the woods, dots basically. In, uh, <laughs> in, in Sunday in the Park that or, is yeah, true. or The Witch and Into the Woods. I mean, how, how much poorer would our lives our artistic lives be if that hadn't come to pass right. so thank you herbert ross for making a box office bomb <laughs> but speaking of into the woods i i do think that as, as certainly as far as the sondheim connection goes we have to bring up this rather uncanny uh coincidence which is that when she is the school teacher at the beginning she is reading the school class the story of rapunzel right exactly yeah, yeah. as it is um you know depicted in into the woods it's it's pretty amazing she's talking about this whole thing yeah isn't that lovely <laughs> i thought that was like wait that was such an easter egg and but you know a backwards easter egg i mean this this is mm-hmm. you know predates into the woods by like eight years yeah, I love those those types of like weird coincidences. This obviously isn't a callback because it hadn't happened yet, but is this weird connective tissue that that holds them together. Yeah, there's a lot of weird Into the Woods references. Well, the few that we've called out here, John McMartin is in this movie. She's reading mm-hmm. Rapunzel. Oh, Steve Martin was uh, cast in the never made Jim Henson version of, of Into the Woods. Who was he going to be? He was going to be the wolf. Oh, yep. I think he would have been great at that. I think he would have been too. Uh, I'll just bring up like, so two other movies that I was thinking about as points of comparison when I was watching this. One was La La Land, which Mm. I think is too much on the other side. You know, I mean, La La Land is just such a nothing burger. Um, (laughs) You know. Wow, hot takes over here by Will White. Oh, yeah. I mean, real original take. I mean, I think (laughs) think that's pretty widely agreed. But I mean, in terms of like a nostalgia for a certain era and a style of music with a more modern story, Mm -hmm. um, I I just think La La... Yeah, I, I... I I I would I prefer this to La La Land just because like this at least has some interest. This will get me in trouble too because I'm actually more positive on La La Land I think than well a lot of other people are. But it always bugged me how the musical sequences were shot mm. in that movie. This is my this is my thing that I keep coming back to. Oh yeah, right. It's, like, it's like too much too much close shot, too much editing. Yeah, modern stuff like that. modern yeah. films just do not know how to shoot musical sequences, and it bugs me to no end. <laughs> when I go back to this, and it's like, yes, look, I can see people and the choreography, and everything is clear, and I know what's going on instead of just like close shot, close shot, close shot, and that way we don't have to actually conceive of a sequence. The other movie that this makes me think of, and probably I would say the closest point of comparison, is the movie Dancer in the Dark. Did you ever see oh, that? Yeah. The, the Bjork the, movie? The Lars von Trier directed movie, yes. I have. Yes. yes. With with uh, with Bjork and Catherine Deneuve. Yeah, that's right. You know, unbeatable casting. I mean, that movie is is probably the most depressing movie yes. um, that I've ever seen. But the musical, uh, you know, montages. I mean, it's Bjork music, but it's Bjork looking back to 1930s musicals. Mm-hmm. And, 
making these huge sound sequences, uh, soundscapes out of like, you know, the sounds from the factory shop that they're working in. And like, they mm -hmm. go into these very fantastical musical sequences. This has more of that. I mean, this, I, yeah. I don't know, this is probably not as depressing and not, but, but more um, authentic to the, to the 1930s, right. of course, I mean, because that's when it takes yeah. place. But it did make me think I, of that movie. That's actually a good call out. I need to rewatch Dancer in the Dark because I've only seen it once back when I was, I'm going to say 16 or 17 years old. And I didn't really mm -hmm. get it at that time. So I think with more knowledge, I think I would appreciate it more. I also have a very embarrassing admission that I have to give here right now. So I started this project back in December. I stumbled across this website which is based on that book, The Thousand and One Albums You Have to Listen to Before You Die. So basically, it's just like this website you go to and it just generates for you the album that you're supposed to listen to that day from the big list. So that's what I do in the mornings. I just like, what album am I listening to? And that's what I listen to while I'm making breakfast and all that other stuff. Anyways, I have learned that I love Bjork <laughs> and I didn't think I did for, for many, many years. Oh, you're only learning now that you love Bjork? Oh, that's, that's right. oh, uh, I'm, so I'm so happy for you. Yeah, that's I've wonderful. Been given, I've been given two of her albums so far. I'm like, I like love this. <laughs> Which two albums? Uh, we have to look them up because I cannot remember their names. Yeah, yeah. I know that this is off topic, but I actually need you to look these up. The two that I have been given were Debut, so one of her early mm -hmm. ones. Mm -hmm. That's the first and one. Then uh, homogenic were the, was the other one that I was given to. So uh, I, 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 I succumbed to the idea in my small town that I grew up in. It's like, she's too weird. She's too out there. She makes bad music. And now I've discovered like, oh, they were all lying. These are, this is great. <laughs> oh, no, she, she's great. She's, she's really, really good. I, I, I can't say that I'm quite as enamored of her stuff in, say, like the last sure. 10 years or something. But boy, yeah. I mean, those albums from the 90s are just, and, they're, and the first part of the 2000s are unbeatable. So, uh, Bjork, everyone. <laughs> I wonder, I, I, I'd be very curious. People write in, like, how much overlap is there between Bjork and Sondheim, Sondheim. appreciation? Because they're, they're very different in a lot of ways, but I don't know. Oh, in yeah. some ways, I could, I, I, you could make a case that mm -hmm. there's, there's some logic behind liking both of them. I, I wouldn't know what the case is off the top of my head. <laughs> so, I guess, final thoughts on Pennies from Heaven. I guess I, I don't have any additional things other than than what I've been saying, which is like, I just think for me, I will happily revisit the musical numbers mm -hmm. in YouTube clip form. You know, in a way, I'm glad that I saw them for the first time embedded in, in the film. But uh, this film has just it's just a weird balance of dark and light. I, I wish that I could talk to somebody who is like, a real partisan of this movie, you know, who really wanted to make like the, the strong case for it. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I can't say that I loved it, but I found it intriguing. And I think it was a great choice for a movie to talk about on a podcast. Yeah, yeah. What about you? Well, the thing that this really, I basically agree with everything you just said. But what I think this really makes me want to do is I now need to like just complete the whole Herbert Ross filmography. Mm. <laughs> and why I say that is like there, there's three of them basically that I've talked about on this show and they're all kind of similar. And there's like interesting, but I don't know if it's good. Like that is, mm. that's, mm -hmm. that's all three of them. I felt that way about is like, there's something here, but I don't know if it like crosses that line into like, you know, good or great territory. It's just like, it's interesting though. And there's some fascinating choices that, that the guy has made. So I want to know if that's just my feelings that are indicative for the whole, the whole thing or not. But I think, yeah, I will definitely, how I will return to this movie more than anything else is revisiting those individual uh, musical scenes rather than like, oh, I'm going to sit down and watch Pennies from Heaven tonight. It's going to just be those musical scenes. I mean, do, so my, my big question for you is, do you recommend this movie to listeners of your podcast? So, OK, this is the bolt I'm going to say. Uh, if people follow me on Letterboxd, you can see that I gave this movie a three out of five star rating. So I would I would give like a modest like thumbs up. I would definitely go and seek it out and watch it because it's definitely going to be. It's not going to be a waste of your time. Let's put, I, I don't I, I don't agree with the, the Fred Astaire quote that it's a, a dreadful two hours of your time. I think there's too many interesting musical sequences in this. I think people will have interest in. But go in with the full knowledge that I think that it is uneven at best. How about Tough you? Tough but fair. I would recommend it to a very particular kind of person. Sure. Um, you know, some uh, to a person who doesn't demand of their two hours of entertainment time that they um, be uh, completely unchallenged or that uh, they are mm -hmm. filled with uncomplicated and unproblematic <laughs> uh, content.
Well, there it is. We have done our bonus episode uh, for this month. Well, if people wanted to stay in contact with you, see what you're up to, what is the best way to do so? Oh, gosh. At this point, uh, I I guess Instagram. I'm semi-active there. We'll see white uh, or uh, my YouTube page. We'll see white. I know what we forgot to do. Because this is the Sondheim and Jason episode, you get to pick what our closing music is for this for this month Ooh. so uh, what what makes the most sense to you to close out this episode with well i think pennies from heaven sure that makes sense <laughs> makes the most sense so we'll listen to a little bit of pennies from heaven as we uh, as we end off great thank you don't run over a tree there'll be pennies from heaven for you